E gridate, 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 sai a me che me ne importa. E parlate, parlate, io fingerò di ascoltarvi per l'ennesima volta. Professor Mosler, secondo lei i deficit pubblici sono la vera causa della crisi europea? In your opinion, are public financial deficits the real cause of European crisis? If Europe had been able to immediately respond to the beginning of the crisis by increasing their deficits, if they'd been able to have that political response, then uh, the crisis would not have been, the, the financial crisis would not have spilled over into the real economy. Okay, so the cause of the crisis in the real economy, the cause of the rising unemployment is always because the deficit is too small. Okay, now, um, but the deficit didn't necessarily cause the financial crisis that caused the drop in aggregate demand. So, for example, um, you could have a massive bank failure because the bank made bad loans. And that could cause uh, a big drop in credit availability for the rest of the economy. But the government can always respond to that drop uh, with either a tax cut or a spending increase to make sure that aggregate demand, that spending stays high enough so that we're at full employment and uh, high levels of output. So I'm not, I'm not trying to duck your question, <laughs> but uh, the, the idea of the deficit causing it is the problem. You have to define the problem. <laughs> And if you define the problem as high unemployment, the answer is yes. It was caused because they did not make the adjustment to let the deficit go up. If you define the problem as a bank failure and shareholders losing money, no. That could be bad loans or that could be something else. So we have to more narrowly define the problem for me to give you an exact answer to your question. So I hope that's helpful. L'euro ha avuto un impatto sulla crisi finanziaria europea? Se sì, come è accaduto? Did the euro currency have an impact on the European financial crisis? If yes, how did it have this impact? Okay, so what the dynamics in Europe with the euro were that Europe it was it was set up based on the traditional mainstream export model. And what an exporter does, what somebody who desires to export does is they keep fiscal policy tight. And the Maastricht Treaty was set up to keep fiscal policy tight, 3% deficit limits, 60% debt to GDP, with some enforcement provisions for violators. At the same time, and this is much uh, what Germany did when Germany was uh, had its own currency, the marks, and was uh, exporting. However, what this policy does is it, it keeps domestic demand down, but it also keep, and it makes the currency harder to get. So it keeps, it makes the currency strong. And so what Germany did, what Japan did, what China does is they then go out and buy foreign exchange to keep their currencies weak enough to keep their real wages and their real costs, which is mainly wages, low enough so that they can net export. Now, this is to the detriment of the population as a whole, but it's to the benefit of certain specific exporters. So the basic model is keep fiscal policy tight and then sell your currency, buy the currency of your target market. Uh, to keep your currency, your real wages low enough so that you can then net export. And at the same time, you accumulate reserves of the targeted export region. So Germany, for example, had something like 50 billion US dollars uh, back when that was a lot of money in 1998 when the currencies were irrevocably locked as part of the strategy. Japan, probably close to 2 trillion in foreign exchange reserves, same as China. All right, now, so the Euro So what they did was they copied that model with the tight fiscal policy, but they can't go out and buy dollars. The ECB can't buy dollars or yen or anything else because that would be an ideological violation. It would make it, it would give the appearance that the dollar is backing the euro if the ECB was building dollar reserves or building yen reserves, right? Then you'd say, oh, look what's behind the euro. Yeah. The yen that they wanted their currency to be the reserve currency like the dollar. The dollar doesn't uh, build any, uh, we don't build any foreign exchange reserves. And so they just did the tight fiscal policy and didn't buy the foreign exchange. So what happens? The currency just goes up to the point where your exports never materialize. And, 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 and as your competitiveness increases and your wages 
get more competitive and your exports start to go up, the currency just gets stronger. And, and so that's where that's what's been going on now since the beginning. But well, the euro was 85 to the dollar at one point. Now it's 130 after being as high as 160. So in general, this policy has thwarted, has you know, has, has kept Europe from becoming the net export that it, that it desires. And let me add one more thing, and that is, it, if you're going to be a net exporter, then you've got to own the foreign exchange of the other country, okay? And nobody has your currency, so. If, if you want your currency to be a reserve currency, you have to be a net importer. Because the United States, for example, we import and we pay for it in dollars, and then so the rest of the world has those dollars. And you had Germany and all the European countries were building dollar reserves, exporting to the US and Japan and China. And so by running a trade deficit, everyone else gets dollars because they sell us tires and cars and we give them dollars, dollar deposits at the Fed. And so the dollar becomes the world's reserve currency because they're using it for reserves to drive exports. Okay, Japan, now why doesn't why isn't the yen a reserve currency? Big, powerful country, uh, second largest economy in the world, because they're a net exporter. So nobody has any yen. Everybody is short yen. When you're an exporter, the world is short your currency. So here's Europe, want it to be a net exporter, which means everyone is going to be net borrowed in euros. And at the same time, they want the euro to be the reserve currency where everybody has euros. Well, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. It can't happen. <laughs> you're just violating the accounting identity. Penso che questo risponda anche alla prossima domanda. A cosa sono dovuti i danni causati dall'euro? Cioè, da cosa dipendono? I suppose that this also answers to the next question, which is uh, what are the damages created by the euro related to meaning what they depend on? Yeah, yeah, so what happens is you can, the export channel is not there. So Europe has very large savings desires, large accumulations of savings. So where can they come from? You know, any currency is just assets and liabilities. It's a simple spreadsheet. So they, so some other sector has to be net borrowed for, for the domestic sector to be net saved. And it's not going to be the foreign sector. You're not going to be able to export. You're just going to make the euro stronger. And the government's yeah. not allowed to do what's, it. What's the question? If you, if, when I would just look at the numbers, I think for Europe to be at full employment today, spending yeah, so has to increase by 5 or 6% yeah, of GDP. Yeah. So that's net spending. So that either has to come from the government cutting taxes and raising spending, or it's got to come from exports, or it's got to come from credit expansion of the private sector. And I don't see any of those three happening under the current political leadership. Una domanda collegata ad una osservazione del professor Brancaccio. Il professor Brancaccio dice che secondo alcuni economisti MMT l'importazione di capitali stranieri sarebbe un elemento positivo. Secondo lui queste considerazioni non sono sufficienti perché prima di tutto sarebbe necessario ridefinire i trattati sullo scambio delle valute e inoltre importando capitali stranieri si rischia di cedere i propri asset strategici. Cosa ne pensa e cosa risponde? Now, a question linked to something Professor Brancaccio said about MMT. According to him, some MMT economists say that it's a good thing to import foreign currencies. In his opinion, this is not enough. First of all, he says it's necessary to redefine currency exchange trades. In addition, by importing foreign currencies, there's the risk for a country to lose its strategic assets. What's your opinion and what do you answer? Well, first, first, first let me say that all, all currencies are MMT currencies because MMT describes every currency. No matter how it's managed, MMT will describe what's going on. So look, you know, this goes back to basic fundamental economics. And, and economics, and I like to say, is the opposite of religion. In economics, it's better to receive than it is to give, right? You want to you, we measure success by material wealth, goods and services. And so you have to separate the real goods and services, which would be cars and houses and handbags and um, personal service, you know, trainer services from the nominal, which are just data in spreadsheets, which is the currency. The currency is not a real, it's just nominal, okay? It's, a, it's just a number. 
you don't actually eat it or drive it or do anything with it. It's just a number. So your real wealth is best described, I like to use my hand here, is your pile of stuff. So your pile of stuff consists of everything you can produce yourself domestically at full employment. Plus, your pile gets bigger when the rest of the world sends you real goods and services. Minus, your pile gets smaller when you have to send the rest of the world goods and services. So your real wealth is your domestic production plus your imports minus your exports. Your exports are the real cost of production. Now, that doesn't mean they're bad, because, the, it, the, but you have to remember the whole purpose of exports is to get imports. So if you can effectively use your exports to get more imports, that's called improving your real terms of trade. Your real terms of trade is what has classically been talked about, which is how much can you get for what you send out? You're going to be sending out exports. You want to get as much possible for it. You want the best real terms of trade for your nation. So if you can send out one Prada handbag and in return get one Mercedes, that's a pretty good exchange. <laughs> your real terms of trade are good. And so Italy's always had, on the, with its luxury exports, exceptionally high real terms of trade and done very well. And uh, however, if you were just going to send out your exports and not import anything, what's the point? You might play golf instead of building something to send to somebody and not use it. Okay, so I don't know if that exactly answers your question. Uh, and your foreign exchange that you build when you export, the only way you get any real benefit from that is if you buy something with it. Just piling up numbers in bank accounts does you no good until you spend it. Parliamo di austerity. È possibile ridurre allo stesso tempo tasse e deficit? Quali sarebbero le conseguenze di queste riduzioni? E ci sono altre opzioni? Let's talk about austerity. Is it yeah. possible to, redu to reduce public deficit and taxes simultaneously? What will be the consequences of these reductions? Do we have yeah. some um, other options? Right, so if you line up 1,000 economists, economic forecasters, Every one of them will agree that if you cut spending, the economy will get worse. GDP will go down, unemployment will go up. Every one of them will agree that if you raise taxes, uh, unemployment will go up, the economy will get worse. Every single one agrees. There's no disagreement. Okay, So why would anybody want to do that if everyone knows it makes the economy worse? And, and Europe has proven it now, the, has proven the obvious, that if you take money away from people, the economy is worse. So why would they want to do it? Because they see some other benefit to reducing the deficit. And what I'm saying is there is no particular benefit or not benefit of the deficit being larger or smaller uh, when you're, you know, for the issuer of the currency. Now, Italy and the other members have put themselves in a position like U.S. states where they need to rely on the European Central Bank to do all the financing. And finally, that's happened. And now, right now, for all practical purposes, the central bank, the ECB, is guaranteeing the debt. So solvency, going broke, not being able to fund yourself is not a problem as long as the central bank is there. And that's true with every country in the world. That's just how currencies work. Once you've recognized the solvency problem is not there, then what difference does it make if the deficit's larger or smaller? Okay, it doesn't make any difference. What makes a difference is whether unemployment is high or low. What makes a difference is what your real terms of trade are. Are you getting the most for your exports? You know, and what is the, what is the uh, distribution of your income? Uh, you know, and, and, and your wealth is your institutional structure causing certain people to get all the income and other people to get nothing. It's all institutional structure that does that. It's not some natural order of things that creates, um, you know, bond traders. <laughs> this is something created by government, you know, that doesn't actually need to be there. Uh, and so, uh, and lawyers and, the, and tax accountants and all these things are created by our legal structure that sets up taxes so complicated that we, you know, empower lawyers to make millions of dollars a year trying to figure it out. We don't have to have this. Okay, but, but so, you know, to get back to your question on austerity, it's, it's driven by this myth that the deficit itself is, has something wrong with it. And that was reinforced by the structure of the... Um, European Union, where it was set up to turn Italy, France, Greece, Germany into what are like U.S. states, and just like the U.S. states, just, you know, 
uh, just like California can go broke or Connecticut, Greece or Portugal or even Germany can go broke if, if things go wrong. However, the European Central Bank doesn't run out of euro any more than the Fed runs out of dollars. If you wasn't too long ago, the European Central Bank just spent one trillion euro. Did anybody ask if that was someone's tax money? Did anybody ask if they borrowed it from China? No. They just credit numbers on the account. There's no question the European Central Bank can spend without being constrained by any kind of revenues. The only thing that constrains it is the political will. If the finance ministers say you can't write a check for this bank, then they can't write it. If the finance ministers say you can write the check, then that check will clear and the funds will go through. Same thing with the Federal Reserve. Chairman Bernanke was asked where the bailout money came from for the banks, and he said, we just mark up the numbers in their accounts. It's not taxpayer money. It doesn't come from anywhere. And that's exactly right. All central banks spend their own currency simply by making data entries into their computer. Okay, and, and the question to do it or not do it is political. There's no market involved. There's no uh, uh, discipline from interest rates or anything like that. And if you notice, all the central banks set their own interest rates. They have a meeting and they take a vote and the rate is zero, or the rate is one, the rate is two. That is, there's no market driving that rate. Okay, and so uh, they're completely in control. The currency itself is a very simple public monopoly. And the central bank is the monopolist. It controls the monopoly. And a monopolist is always price setter and not price taker. And a monopolist always determines value for his own product by telling you what you have to do to get it. He's the only one with it. Okay, and so... Uh, you know, this austerity, I just call it a crime against humanity at this point. It's, it's, it's awful. And it's all done on either a misconception or, you know, some horrendous plan that I can't even imagine anybody would actually have. From all the people I've talked to, I, I think it's a misconception, but I could be wrong. It could be some grand conspiracy. I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm too little a person to, to know. I'm not in those circles. Come possiamo ridurre la disoccupazione in Europa o in Italia? How can we reduce the unemployment rate in Europe or in Italy? Okay, so to reduce unemployment, the Maastricht limits need to be changed. Uh, you need to raise the deficit limits so Smart. that they go from 3% of GDP, I and my best guess is about 8% of GDP. Um, okay, unless those limits are raised, there's no way unemployment's going to come down. And if the uh, European uh, Union refuses uh, to do that and, okay. and continues to keep the limits at 3% and then force balanced budgets to get there, I was able to run it then on the only way to get the full employment would be to well, start you know, your own currency again. The start bar Go back the to business. something like the lira. But even then, you've got to be very careful because if the political leaders and I was able to write at that time have the same mindset as the European oh. leaders today and want to balance the budget, it's going to be just as bad. Look, the United States has its own currency, England has its own currency, and what do they do? They undergo the same austerity. Okay, you've got to have leadership that understands unemployment is always caused by the budget deficit being too small. If you've got unemployment, the budget deficit is too small. You need to either cut taxes or raise spending, depending on your politics. You are not, for a given size government, spending is not high enough for people to pay their taxes and to save. And so the evidence is unemployment. And it's, it's um, just a simple point of logic. There's no way around it. It's easy. Right. Any third grader right. can understand this. <laughs> and uh, it's tragic what's happening. And again, a crime against humanity, whether intentional or not. Concorda con l'analisi della crisi del professor Bagnai? Do you agree with uh, Alberto Bagnai's analysis of the crisis? Well, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but the, the reason for the unemployment is because the deficits are too small. Now, sometimes the deficit needs to be larger, sometimes it needs to be smaller. All you do is count bodies in the unemployment line. If the line's too long, the deficit's too small. If the unemployment line gets too short and everybody has a job and you know, companies are trying to steal them from each other and the price of houses is going up every day, the, the deficit's too large. It needs to be made smaller, no matter what size it starts out at. Okay, so the, the, again, you have to define what the crisis is. To me, the crisis is the rise in unemployment, the loss of output, and the destruction of the culture. That part of the crisis is always caused by the deficit being too small 
for the given set of circumstances. Now, one day, a 1% deficit might be just perfect because the private sector is borrowing like crazy and expanding their credit at 5 or 6% a year. The next day, the private sector may have had all their credit cards taken away, and now you need an 8 or 10% deficit. Uh, the next day, foreign governments might be spending all their foreign exchange reserves, and you may need to run a surplus. It's going to change. But, but the right size deficit is the one that sustains full employment with reasonable price stability. And now I'm not, I don't know if that's how he says it or not, but that's, that's the case. That's the way it is. Un'ultima domanda. È difficile credere che in Europa siano tutti sprovveduti ed abbiano fatto errori senza sapere quel che facevano. E allora viene da chiedersi, a chi conviene? Chi è che guadagna dalla loro crisi? The very last question. It's hard to believe that in Europe uh, they don't know what they are doing, they do errors like this. And the question is, who is gaining profit from the crisis of the Eurozone? I think everyone's losing, for the most part. Now, you, you get some bureaucrats that are sustaining their lifestyle, like having nice lunches every day and staying at nice hotels and getting some yeah. nice salaries. But that's a very minor part of what's happening. Every corporation, every industrialist would do much, much better at full employment. Output would be up within five years. It would probably double. And corporate profits would be higher. People would be living better with more real output. Everybody, everybody benefits. You always want to grow the pie and have more to distribute. Right now, uh, it's like we're in a fishbowl and the water's running out and the fish are getting frantic. They're running out of water. They're thrashing around. They're fighting with each other. You may have a few of them doing well, but with more water in that fishbowl, then they're all going to do well. And that's, uh, you know, and that's why I suspect some of the conspiracy theory about these people. The banks would do much better in a good economy where they could make loans and you know, businesses like your car industry was selling twice as many cars. Everybody does better. You know, it's it's just a case of uh, global suicide, economic suicide, where everybody's going over the same cliff. It, it's terrible. It's the worst I could have ever imagined. The losses right now from unemployment and our weak economy are larger probably in one year than all the losses from all the wars in history. Now, I'm not talking about the human life, although there is a lot of human life being lost now, but just the actual material losses. Nobody understands how prosperous the world really is and could be right now if we could just understand the currency and get ourselves you know, back to full employment and sustain full employment. Let me just add, a banking crisis cannot cause unemployment. Okay, A banking crisis cannot cause a drop in output. It's the response to the crisis that causes the drop in output. Banks are just numbers on pieces of paper entries on spreadsheets. The real world is people getting up in the morning, growing food, and then eating it. People building cars and driving them. People building buildings and living them. People going to hospitals and taking care of sick people. People doing all kinds of things. That's the real world. And just because a lot of numbers change on some spreadsheet and some bank from plus to minus doesn't mean that has to stop. That world is driven by sales. People being able to, uh, to spend money uh, to, to buy output from is compete for consumer dollars. And a bank failure should not take away the consumer dollars to prevent the corporations from competing for consumer dollars. It only does because of the policy response. And the policy response can always be a tax cut or a spending increase to make sure that we stay at full employment and maximum output. There's no excuse for not doing that, except that they don't understand the currency. And that's the tragedy of this whole thing. The best of times have turned into the worst of times over this, this tragedy of the currency. This scenario looks even worse than a conspiration one. Oh, yeah. And here you're facing an election where no matter who wins, they've all got it wrong. And I, I'm, my fear is that it, it turns into what we call blood in the streets. And, you know, they just push it hard enough and make it bad enough until blood in the streets is what stops them. And it's happened, you know, many times in the last hundred years. And my biggest fear is that it gets pushed to that again. Thank you very much, Professor Mosler. You're welcome. Thank you very much.
La Modern Money Theory è una teoria post-keynesiana che analizza e descrive le economie moderne in cui la moneta nazionale è di tipo fiat, priva cioè di valore intrinseco e non coperta da riserve di altri materiali. Questa condizione di sovranità monetaria permette agli stati che emettono la propria moneta di perseguire obiettivi come la piena occupazione e la stabilità dei prezzi, secondo le regole della finanza funzionale, che danno maggiore priorità agli obiettivi citati piuttosto che a livello del bilancio pubblico. Poiché i governi con sovranità monetaria hanno il monopolio di emissione della moneta, essi possono utilizzare i propri bilanci senza vincoli finanziari per sostenere la domanda di beni e servizi e possono promuovere inoltre dei programmi di lavoro garantito assumendo direttamente i disoccupati. Essa affonda le sue radici in autori come Knapp, Keynes, Lerner e il gruppo di studiosi che ne ha creato il corpo teorico inizia la sua attività negli anni 90 con le pubblicazioni di autori come Warren Mosler, Randall Ray, Matthew Forstater ed altri e sta trovando sempre più diffusione sia nel dibattito accademico che presso il pubblico. In Italia la teoria è stata introdotta dal giornalista Paolo Barnard, autore del saggio Il più grande crimine, tramite due summit nazionali di grande impatto.